Hi, and welcome to the Personal Story Coach Podcast, Episode 2. My name is Scott Swanson. Um, I mentioned in my first episode of the podcast that uh, this is born out of my work uh, in working with people around how the stories they tell about what's going on uh, inside them or around them affect their uh, experience of the world and in turn the way other people experience them <clears throat> um, if you listen to episode one uh, you might remember that i said that i am recording these podcasts in a way that is extremely uncomfortable for me which is to say without a script uh, i've been speaking publicly for years in a number of different settings but almost always with a full script. And part of what I'm challenging myself to do with this podcast is to not do that. And it's terrifying. And it's funny that it's terrifying because I'm actually recording this rather than live streaming it. So it's not like I even have to publish this if I was really unhappy with it. Um, and yet, uh, I feel within myself this nervousness around speaking off the cuff without notes. Um, and I'm also not going to edit it. I'm just going to put it out there. Now, at some point, I may change that. I may start having a bit of a script or some notes or, um, or some edits. But at least in these early days, I want to challenge myself to do this. So with, you know, all the apologies in the world for if, if this is painful to listen to me stuttering and stopping and starting. I tell you that about um, the, 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 the sense of anxiety or fear or discomfort I have from speaking without notes, because it's an illustration of the point that I'm trying to make in the work that I do, which is that we tell ourselves stories about the world. And those stories that we tell ourselves then interpret how we experience reality. So what are the stories I'm telling myself right now? Um, they might be things like, if I don't sound slick, if I don't sound polished, if I don't sound professional, Nobody's going to want to listen to this, or they're not going to take me seriously, uh, or I'm going to sound stupid. Those might be some of the stories I'm telling myself, and I don't want uh, to sound stupid. I don't want uh, people to not take me seriously, et cetera. Um, part of how I came to this um, way of thinking about um, how we work with people, how I work with people, how people work, uh, is based on the writings of a guy named Victor, Victor Frankl, F-R-A-N-K-L. If you haven't read any Victor Frankl, I encourage you to do that uh, if you're into that sort of thing. So Victor Frankl was a, um, uh, lived, uh, was a Jewish man who lived in the middle of the 20th century in Europe. And um, spent a, a number of years during the war in a concentration camp, in various concentration camps and work camps. Uh, he survived the war and he went on to uh, become a psychologist. And um, actually, he'd been a psychologist before that, I think, and developed uh, this whole way of um, thinking about the connection between suffering and meaning. And, um, and so his, his primary work is a book called Man's Search for Meaning, middle of the 20th century. So, you know, it was man back then, people, human beings search for meaning. And really what he was talking, what he was interested in how, was how um, in the concentration camps, in the work camps, in the death camps, uh, particularly in the work camps, um, there would be some people who would give up 
and die. And then there would be others who uh, who wouldn't, who, who for whatever reason didn't give up and, and survived. And he was interested in why, why is that? Why do some people in that situation give up and when they give up, they die? Whereas other people um, somehow find a way to keep going. And so he's really interested in this connection between uh, suffering and meaning and the importance of humans being able to make meaning um, out of their suffering, at least something that, that, that is meaningful to them. It doesn't Nobody else has to agree with it, but they have to be able to um, locate some, some sense of some North Star, some sense of grounding in the midst of their experience. And he identifies this moment when, um, when you experience something. So think about, you know, whatever this is, you, you have an experience of, let's say another person, uh, or something happening, um, out in the world. Somebody says or does something either to you or to somebody else. Perhaps you see it firsthand. Perhaps it's in the news. But you have this experience. And there's this little moment after the experience. And in that, in that fraction of a moment, there's a choice made about how you're going to respond to what's just happened. So, um, I mean, whatever the experience is, you, you can, you can make that up for yourself, but, but just imagine a situation where something, something happens and, and we'll say it's something, you know, that you would interpret as you'd be inclined to interpret as negative. And, um, and you have this moment where you get to make a choice about how you're going to understand the thing that's just happened. In other words, the story that you're going to tell yourself about that thing. And for a lot of us, it doesn't feel like that. It doesn't, it doesn't always feel like we have a choice in how we are going to respond to the things that happen to us or around us. Um, and, but the fact is that and then there will be other people who will say, oh, yeah, I get that. I, I, I do have this choice. I do. There's this moment where I get to decide, am I going to be defeated by this? Am I going to see this as something bad? Um, am I going to see this as an opportunity? Um, and, 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 and so that moment can be worked with. That moment can, um, can be... Maybe Todd isn't the isn't the right word, but 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 a person can teach themselves and can engage in a practice of first of all trying to expand that moment to turn it from you know a millisecond into a tenth of a second into half a second into a full second to give more space to give more time to then say how. Do I want to respond? Do I want to respond out of anger? Do I want to respond out of compassion? Do I want to uh, succumb to my initial inclination to be afraid? Um, do I want to cultivate curiosity? And and then depending on what a person does, the way a person responds to that influences how they begin to see the rest of the world. John Keats, uh, he was a British, he's mostly known now as a poet, living at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century in London. London was a terrible place at the beginning of the 19th century. There were 
all sorts of horrible infestations and plagues and, and, you know, nastiness and death and, and like, it was a terrible place to be as I suppose most cities were back then. And, um, Keats had this, uh, so you've heard, you heard the language, the veil of tears, veil as in valley, a valley of tears. Keats differentiated between the veil of tears, the valley of tears, and the veil of soul making. And his point was that life, um, the suffering that comes to us in life, we can choose to see that as just meaningless, pointless, um, a, veil, a valley of tears, right? That, that, that serves no purpose other than just to make our life miserable. Or we can see it as a valley of soul making. In other words, a series of opportunities to, um, to create that crucible, that, that, that oven in which something beautiful can be formed. We don't want to romanticize suffering. Um, I mean, Keats was in a situation where suffering was just the reality. It was a very different world than the one that most of us live in today. Although there's lots of people even in 2022 who are living in, in pretty horrible circumstances. So we don't want to glorify suffering or, um, somehow make those who suffer noble. But I think there's value in just recognizing that suffering is. Suffering is a part of life, whether it's physical suffering, whether it's you know, psychological suffering. Um, in Western societies, uh, probably more of our suffering now is uh, psychological and emotional uh, than it is physical, although many people still, you know, deal with a lot of physical suffering as well. So it's not to make it noble, you know, or, or anything like that, but it's just to simply recognize that that is one part of what it means to be human. And so we can deny it, we can pretend it doesn't happen, we can medicate against it through all the myriad ways in which we do that in our culture. Or we can see it f as an opportunity for us to uh, grow. Um, and, and one of the ways that we can do that is using those opportunities in that moment when suffering happens like it did for Viktor Frankl in the work camps in um, uh, Germany and Poland in World War II. We can use those moments of suffering as opportunity or those experiences of suffering as opportunities to practice choosing how to respond in a way that is going to be more life-giving for us that is going to be more hope filled for us um, and for the people around us. And um, in the process uh, to begin to create a world in which, what do I wanna say? That suffering is, um, can become a means to our own growth and transformation. Um, and that's part of what personal story coach is about, right? So there's this whole thing right now. Um, I mentioned last time that I'm a pastor. And, and so there's this thing that called spiritual bypassing, which is spiritual bypassing is, is like, well, you know, it's all going to be fine. Just, you know, trust in the Lord or whatever, and, and all will be well. In other words, by trying to get around the suffering, bypassing the pain. We have the sec this, this, the same things happens in the secular world. And you'll see this in a lot of uh, personal growth stuff, right? This whole positive, oh, you know, smile, be happy. And, and there's some truth to that. There is some truth to 
the fact that our um, our physical demeanor, et cetera, influences how we feel. But there's also the risk of this attempt to positively bypass pain and suffering and in the process not learn from it. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to wallow in it, but we also, and we don't want to give into it. We don't want to be overwhelmed by it, uh, but we want to learn from it. We want to gather from it what it has to teach us. And one of the ways that we go about doing that is by thinking differently about the suffering by telling ourselves and the people around us different stories about what this suffering means. Um, so that's, that's a big part of what the work is, is how do we understand what's happening to us and how do we, by thinking differently about it, then begin to experience it differently, then begin to uh, learn what it can teach us and begin to grow and um, become stronger and become more healthy and become people who can then enter into the suffering of other people and be hopefully a transformative presence in their life as well. Okay, that's more than enough for episode two. Here I was afraid I wasn't gonna have anything to say. Thanks very much. If you uh, enjoyed this, uh, you, you know how the drill works. You can help me out by uh, liking this, by subscribing, by uh, sending this to one or two or one or 200 people who you think would also enjoy it and encourage them to subscribe. And um, you can find me over at personalstorycoach.com or scottrswanson.com. They both lead you to the same place. And uh, yeah, drop me a note, say hi. And um, thanks very much for checking this out. See you later.